Hi, I'm Laura Greedy, and I'm an intellectual property attorney at Smith Amundsen, and I spend most of my day dealing with patents, trademarks, and copyrights. And today I'm going to talk a little bit about copyrights and some of the how and when you could file your own copyright application. Copyright is one of the forms of IP that is set forth in the Constitution. In exchange for publishing a work, the government will grant the author a period of protection on that work. And there's many things, most of them you're probably aware of that are protected by copyright. You've got your pictures, your books, your recordings, your songs, your lyrics, software code by copyright, and sculptures, um, anything that's considered a 2D or three-dimensional work of art, so your thumbnails on phones or app pictures, um, anything that you publish on your website, whether that's um, photos, images, if you're doing a new web campaign that's got some artwork associated with it. Um, any of those little jingles or something that you write and create yourself. Um, some things that are not protectable by copyright are um, names, common phrases or common, issue, uh, common pictures, common images, things that are in the public domain, um, lists of facts, and concepts uh, themselves are not protectable by copyright, while the individual expression of a concept can be. An example of a concept that is, uh, that is not protectable by copyright would be your lighthouse at sunset. An individual expression of that though, such as this picture would be protectable by copyright. So why register a copyright? You get some element of protection for your copyrightable works just by virtue of having made them. So the moment that you write something, you draw something, you have an element of protection. And once you release that to the public, once you publish it in some way, you get a little bit more protection for those works. The benefits of registering your copyright are, uh, first of all, it's a prerequisite for filing an infringement action. You have to have that registration number to do that. And it's uh, necessary to have that in order to get statutory damages and attorney's fees in an infringement action. Uh, sometimes the actual damages for infringing a copyright can be quite low, particularly with how quickly and how available images are online. Oftentimes the statutory damages and the attorney's fees add up to more and they can add up to more quickly. It's also inexpensive to file a basic copyright application, $65 to submit the application online. And the applications for very basic works of authorship are pretty easy. And I am going to go ahead and walk you through actually filing a very basic copyright application for a basic, basic work. So we're going to be looking at just a written work, a book, or a two-dimensional piece of artwork that was created entirely um, from scratch. So nothing that uses any pre-existing work and nothing that is built upon something that had been done previously. So when you're going to submit a copyright application, the first thing you need to do is go to copyright.gov. And over on the right in the gray bar, there are some categories. If you hit the chevron next to registration, you click on register your work. You will need to create an account. And if you scroll down, you'll need to log into your account. If you haven't created an account before, it is pretty easy. You'll just have to enter some basic information and create a password similar to creating an account anyplace else. I am going to go ahead and log into my account. So once you're in your account, you get your initial dashboard up here. And if we have any open cases, those would be right in the front here. Off on the left are the menu of things that you can do. First, you've got a area where you can look at all of your cases that are filed under your account. And you can go down to the registration section and pick the type of work that you're going to register. In this case, we're going to focus on just registering a basic work using a standard application. There are some exceptions as to when this cannot be used, uh, when the standard form cannot be used. If you're going to be registering a collection or a group of unpublished works, or if you're going to register a larger group of photographs, you'd want to use a different application, and that information is put up here. Um, for, for most people doing an application on their own, I'd recommend sticking to the standard application and looking at just one work, a two-dimensional work of art, um, potentially a three-dimensional work of art if it's a basic sculpture. We're going to go ahead and start the registration process. The first thing you enter is the type of work. There's a drop down here, and it lists a couple different types of work. And these are the ones that are appropriate to use for this basic application. 
There's literary work or work of the visual arts, which are the two easiest to file applications for. The remaining works, a sound recording, a work of the performing arts, motion picture AV work, or a single serial issue, those can get more complicated and they can get more complicated quickly. And I would recommend getting help or at least consulting with somebody on the application before filing those. In this case, we're gonna use a work of the visual arts as an example. So this would apply for many companies if there's an online store and you've got pictures of your products online that you'd like to protect, or if you're doing an ad campaign or making a new banner, uh, if you have a social media account and you're looking to protect a thumbnail or other static image, that would be a work of the visual arts. If it's an instruction manual or a product guide of some sort, where it would be more of a literary work, you'd select that. For example, we're going to do the work of visual arts. It gives some more information here on what a work of the visual arts is, just so that you can make sure you've selected the right category. Once you've read that description and confirm it's what you're doing, go ahead and click the box. Next, time to enter the title of the work. Um, there are some works that may not have a title, and there's certainly an area where you can put in untitled. Title type, we are going to do the title of the work being registered. If you have to select any of these other option, options, the previous title or a title of a larger work or your series, your contents title, I would recommend getting somebody to assist with the application or at least look it over before it's filed. So we're going to select title of the work, and then you can type in the title. So we're going to do copyright. Once the title's in, you hit save. The information shows up here, the title of the work, and here's the type of title that it is. Everything looks good. Hit continue. Publication information. Has this work been published? This is a yes or no option. For the purpose of this demonstration, we're going to go ahead and hit yes. That your application has been published, it means that you've released it to the public in some way, and that's in some way more than just giving copies of something to family and friends. So this is you've posted it online where the public can get at it, um, you've put it on Amazon, it's available for sale, or you're otherwise handing it out in some way. If you don't have a published work or you haven't published it yet, I would recommend getting some help with the application or waiting until it's published to fill out the application. So once you select yes, you have to enter some further information. There's only a couple fields that are required. You have the nation of first publication, which for most purposes is going to be the United States. And then we've got the year of completion. Um, for purposes of this demonstration, we're gonna put that it was completed this year. If you have any international standard numbers, you'd enter that information over here. Uh, the date of first publication, we're gonna consider that today's date. If you would have had a pre-registration number for this work, you'd enter the pre-registration number here. If you do have a pre-registration number, I'd suggest getting assistance with this application to make sure that it is appropriately considered. Once all the information's in, go ahead and hit continue. Next, we get a window to enter the author information. When it comes to copyright, the author is the person or entity who has actually created the work of art. Um, so that's going to be the person who designed the graphics on the computer. It's going to be the person who held the paintbrush. It's going to be the person who actually typed the words in, absent some other agreement or relationship in place. So if you're looking at a work of art created by employees in the course of their employment, if these employees generally and routinely make this type of art, um, if they are using all company resources to do it and it's expected of them to do it with those resources, that would be considered a work made for hire. And the author in that case would be the company that they work for. We are going to go ahead and add a new author. And for purposes of this demonstration and what's most likely going to be happening if you are a company submitting a, a copyright application is that you have employees that made the work as part of their employment. So the entity, so your company is going to be the author. So I will go ahead and make an entity and put it in this box here. If you would be filing this as an individual, you would put your individual information on this side. So is this contribution a work made for hire? In this case, because we're using the fact pattern of employees having made the work in the course of their employment, we're gonna select yes. Next, we have to put in the author's citizenship or domicile. When you're working with an organization, if the organization is established in the US, if it's registered or incorporated in the US, you're gonna select the United States. Only the citizenship or domicile, not both, are required. Um, so if you have an individual as the author, 
you'd have to populate whichever one of those is applicable. If you have an individual, you'd also put in the year of birth. It's not required, but it's highly suggested, and the year of death if the author has died. We also have some boxes on the right to mark if it's an anonymous work or if it's going to be published under a pseudonym. There are different rules that are at play when you have an anonymous work or a work published under a pseudonym, particularly when it comes to the term of the copyright. So if you're going to check either of those boxes, I'd recommend getting somebody to look over the copyright application or assist. Once all the information is filled out, you can go ahead and click save. Next, you have to pick what it is in the work that the author has created. In this case, we're going to pretend that it's a two-dimensional work of art, a computer designed graphic, you're going to select that box. Other options are the photograph, um, sculpture. You can also get copyright protection for um, buildings, for architectural work or technical drawings, as well as maps. Um, so you could select those here. If you are going to be protecting one of those other forms of art, I would recommend having somebody just look over the form to make sure that everything is properly claimed in the application. Once you've selected your work, you're going to go ahead and hit save. Now you'll see that the author that we entered is listed in the information bar here. Assuming that is your only author, you're going to go ahead and hit continue. Next, you have to fill in information for the claimant. So the author is who made the work, and the claimant is going to be who owns the work. When you have the employment situation where the employees made the work of art, and it was a work made for hire, and the entity is, is the author, the entity is also going to be the claimant. That is a good situation for using this basic copyright form. If you have a situation where it's an independent contractor who made the work and they were commissioned to make the work for an entity, the independent contractor would be the author and the claimant would be the entity. So you're going to go ahead and hit new to add a new claimant. And again, in this case, because it was an employment situation, we're going to go ahead and populate this area with the uh, made up entity information. So we went ahead and put an address in there. You'll notice that only the address and the city are required in this section. I also went ahead and populated state, zip, and country. It's suggested that you do so. It's not required. The section down here is regarding a transfer statement. I mentioned before that uh, there has to be certain agreements in place if you have uh, different author and claimant parties. So if you have the independent contractor, who's assigning their work to you as a commissioned piece of work, that would be a transfer statement that needs to be addressed here. The little dropdown gives a couple options. By written agreement is what you'd mostly have. If it's a transfer by inheritance, I'd recommend getting some assistance with this form just to make sure that everything is properly done. I've never run into a situation really where we do other. In this case, there's no transfer statement necessary. It was a work made for hire in the course of normal employment, so we'll go ahead and hit save. Now the claimant information is popping up in the information bar. Everything is good. We'll go ahead and hit continue. The next section is to put a limitation on the copyright claim. This would be used in situations where you have a update to an existing piece of art, or if you're adding information to an existing book, if you're making a second version of an instruction manual or a user guide, um, or if you've used um, some clip art or some stock imagery or anything that you're licensing from an from a entity, you would have to exclude that from your copyright. If that is the case and you need to make a limitation on your claim, I'd recommend getting some assistance with the application or at least having somebody look it over before it's filed to make sure everything is properly claimed or limited and excluded from the claim. In our hypothetical situation here, the employees made everything entirely themselves in the course of their normal employment, so we don't need to limit anything. We'll just go ahead and hit continue. The rights and permissions is optional, but it's highly suggested that you put somebody or at least an email address in here. This will be uh, how a third party would contact you if they'd like to use your work of art. So if you have some photographs that you're going to be using on your website or on a blog, and another person would like to use those or repurpose them or would like to share that art on their website, this is the contact information that would be available to them to reach out to. Uh, it can be an email address that you set up specifically for receiving this type of information or a PO box that you establish solely for this uh, form of communication, um, as long as it is something that somebody is checking. I'm gonna go ahead and just fill out some basic information. 
If you are working with an attorney on IP matters, you could use the attorney's information here, but please just let us know first if you're going to be doing that. If you've got some information in here, go ahead and hit continue. The correspondent information is important. Uh, when the Copyright Office receives your application, there's going to be a copyright examiner that's going to examine it. They're not going to look at the work of art specifically. They're not going to make any judgment as to whether or not you copied or anything, but they're going to inspect the application and make sure that it is technically correct and that it at least matches the work of art that you're describing. If they have a question, the copyright examiner is going to send an email to the email address that is on file here. You are required to put an email address in. So I am going to go ahead and populate that with my information. Um, you can use your information or if you have an email address or something set up solely for receiving these sorts of communications, you can put that in as long as there's somebody who's going to be checking it because you will have a deadline by which to respond to a copyright examiner. So see that the state and the zip code and the country are not required, we highly suggest that you put that in just in case it would be needed. Now that all the information is in, we'll hit continue. The mail certificate section. This is where you put a physical mailing address that the Copyright Office can send the registration certificate to. They'll send a nice little beautiful certificate and you want to make sure that you receive that. Uh, so you can use a PO box if it's something that's checked frequently. Um, otherwise, wherever there'd be somebody to receive mail. I'm going to go ahead and just put in my information. And you'll see that this time the state and the zip code are required because this is where you're going to get something physically mailed to and you know that it will be coming. Once all the information is in there, go ahead and hit continue. Next, you can select whether any special handling is required. A special handling is generally used in situations where there's infringement happening, happening or there's a potential litigation happening. Uh, for example, if you're a company and you have an online retail shop and you notice that a third party that's not affiliated with you has started reselling your product and they're doing so using images directly from your website. So photographs of the product that you took in-house and they are your photographs. Um, in that case, if you haven't filed a copyright application on those photographs yet, this would be the time to do it. And you can select special handling for the pending prospective litigation. Then once you have those registration numbers, you have the extra oomph behind you to ask the third party retailer to stop using those pictures. Um, other reasons you might request special handling is if you have a customs issue with um, some import export of works of art and you need the copyright registration to go through quickly. Uh, that would be another reason to select special handling. In this case, I'm not going to select any special handling, so we'll just hit continue. A certification. Uh, this is a required section. It is basically saying that you certify that you have the authority, authority to be filing this copyright application for this particular work that you are registering. So I'm going to go ahead and click that as the author and claimant, and then you put in your name. Once the information is in, you can hit continue. If you'd like to put an internal tracking number or if you have a docket number, you can put that there. And the last thing you get is a summary of your application. So you've got the title of the work, the publication information that you entered, the author information. If you scroll down, you get the claimant information as well as any limitations followed by all the addresses that you put in for the rights and permissions, contact, the correspondence, or to mail a certificate. Everything looks good. You can scroll back up to the top. You can save the application for later if you'd like to submit it later. If you're doing many things with the same information in it, you can save this as a template. And if you're ready to file, you can hit Add to Cart. Once you've added it to your cart, you'll see that your application is showing up in the cases in cart. And for a basic application, it's a $65 fee due to the Copyright Office. If you need to review your application, you can do that. You'll get some more details here. And if everything looks good, you can go ahead and hit checkout. I'm not going to hit checkout. That will take you to a payment page. But the one thing I have to say is when you are done paying and submitting your application, there is this third part over here that says submit work. So you filled out your form. This is the payment page. And once that's complete, you have to submit a work. Um, so for published cases, which is what you should be using this form for, the Copyright Office does require that you submit what is called a deposit copy that's stored in the Library of Congress. Um, that deposit copy can be submitted electronically if it's an electronically published work. You can also submit a copy of your work in hard form, which is what you do if it's not an electronically published work. Once you check out and you, go, and you get the submit work window, 
Uh, you get more information on the file types that are allowed if it's an electronic work, or you get the option to print out a uh, shipping label and a barcode and the information that you'd need to send in a physical copy and have it associated with your application. And that is how you'd file a basic copyright application for a basic work of art, such as your two-dimensional work of art, your literary work, um, something that you publish online like that, um, even, even your simple three-dimensional works of art that you'd mail in the um, deposit copy for. Uh, if you've got any situations, again, where you're using um, clip art or stock photographs, um, if you've got an ad campaign where you're using um, background music that's been licensed from somebody else and that you didn't create in-house, um, you're going to be filling out a more complicated version of this application. And we definitely suggest that you, you get help filling out that application or at least have somebody look it over before you hit that submit button. Again, my name is Laura Greedy, and I hope you found this short video informational and that you feel empowered to go and file your own copyright applications.